Thank you, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much to SLU and for inviting us and getting us here. Um, this was my task. Um, I've got a fair number of slides, so I'm going to rattle through them. I hope uh, uh, they make some sense. I'm going to, first of all, look at some of the major changes uh, in aquaculture in recent decades and think about the status and trajectories, think about some of the societal impacts before then thinking about how can we spread best practice? What can we do to move information from just information into economic activity? And think about some models that we might use for doing that. Aquaculture's the new kid on the street, really, when it comes to food production. Although it's been around for thousands of years in tiny parts of the world, uh, such as China, um, or bits of China, um, it's really the last three decades we see major changes. And I think it's worth considering what the predisposing conditions have been to that change, perhaps think about some of the barriers and constraints, and then also what have the agents of change been? Clearly it's spread in terms of geographical spread and scope, but there's also been this process of, of intensification happening, and I think the question is, is that really sustainable? Now we know, many people might have seen this graph, it does show how, first of all, the modernity of aquaculture in real terms and how it's not replaced fisheries in any sense of the word, it's added to it. And the reasons for that, of course, are population growth and more people eating more seafood, aquatic products. Let's just call it fish. Of course, it's not just fish. It's a whole uh, mess of different animals and plants uh, across uh, the, the animal and plant kingdoms. It's truly diverse. But yes, Fortunately, food supply has kept up in global terms with uh, population growth. And although these products have been used in the past for non-food uses, that's probably declined a bit, and more and more of it's entering the food chain that we know. Aquaculture is not evenly spread around the world. We heard uh, first off how uh, Sweden lays, uh, has some hopes that uh, freshwater uh, fisheries, for example, uh, can become a larger part of the, of the overall food supply. Um, very important in the areas where, you know, six out of every 10 kilos farmed globally comes from one country, China. Uh, another almost two and a half comes from the rest of Asia. So it really does, as you can see, North America, South America, Europe, they're tiny slivers. Here in Northwest Europe, we hear a lot about salmon and the growth of salmon, whether we like it or don't like it. But actually, in terms of the global whole, it's tiny. I think aquaculture, let's face it, suffers a lot of criticism. How justified is that? Is it really food for the elite, as has been claimed recently, and indeed, iteratively over several years? Um, where it is being established, people say, it's being mainly aimed at wealthier consumers, perhaps in domestic cities or in international markets, rather than local rural areas. Um, and true, you know, you go to a Beijing market where everything's got to be live and very, or very, very fresh, and these crabs indeed have been collected from uh, uh, brackish water ponds in Bangladesh. So international trade's not just about Asia to Europe or Asia to Africa, it's about within, it's regional trade as well, and this has really come up as being very important. And I think these same authors make the point about when we explicitly plan aquaculture, then maybe we can get a better type of aquaculture. Um, but I think there's good evidence to the contrary, and that really is that if you look at the data, aquaculture growth has driven down the real price of most farm fish around the world, just as many wild fish unit prices climbed. Um, farm fish are increasingly accessible by the poor. Lots of studies, particularly in, in countries like Bangladesh, are showing this how, in fact, poor people are finding farm fish more accessible, whether they're in the city or in rural areas. And a lot of this is about supply and productivity growth in the sector. And uh, we're in the process of publishing that. And this really sort of, I hope, brings it home a little bit that it's, it's really not just for the wealthy. If we take the 10 big aquaculture nations of the world and we look at both fisheries and aquaculture, normally it's geared to domestic markets. When you look at the countries where that's not the case, Vietnam and Thailand, I think we've already heard that actually they enjoy very high per capita consumption. So it's not a sort of uh, 
we're sending all the good food overseas at all, as it's sometimes claimed. A lot of this comes out of the process of intensification. And here in West Java, in Indonesia, one of the most densely populated places in the world, you can clearly see this culture of small, live, common carp, a specific feature of that market, is driven by market demand. In other places, water and land constraints are forcing this intensification or stimulating it. And in some cases, such as shrimp, health management is really pushing intensification. Uh, more intense systems, more biosecure systems to try and control disease problems. So this issue of private cages in public water is a big one in, 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 in many emerging areas around the world in small in low and medium income countries. Jatalu Reservoir, a new resource in the 60s, the hope was this would be a multi-purpose uh, system that provided irrigation, electricity, provided a natural fishery, and what happened was that a simple, uh, a simple innovation of fish farming was introduced in cages and very quickly this changed the whole situation, the whole resource base. And so this idea of planned aquaculture is an interesting one in, in many contexts. Um, when we looked at this, this was planned by the MOF, the Ministry of Fishes in, in Indonesia, and they put a, a, a limit on under 30,000. Um, in fact, it's a lot more than that, and almost 3% of the water area is covered by cages. And this really points that the, the rapid growth that, and scale-up that's actually happened in some parts of the world. It's not just that this is now supplying important markets and giving people fish to eat, which they might not have had. It's also encouraging or causing a lot of other issues. Who owns and access those cages? Who benefits? Is it the people who were displaced by the original reservoir project? Yes, to some extent. But there's also and particularly the larger systems, tend to be owned or controlled by outsiders. So there are social, environmental tensions. Carrying capacity, as we call it, has clearly been exceeded. This is something that we don't want to happen all over the world. So how can we move towards more sustainable aquaculture? And should it be subsistence? And this was a question I was glad was posed right at the beginning. Self-provisioning. How much and to what extent should we be supporting, researching towards market-orientated aquaculture? And should that be household or group or corporate-based? And are we doing it for food or for profits? And is it just another part or should it be considered really as a part of accessible, balanced diets on a crowded planet? So I'd like to just pitch this idea of sustainable intensification of food and agriculture now in terms of, of aquaculture just for a few slides to, to show you some of that landscape in terms of aquaculture. And of course, we need increased production. Can we do it uh, through get higher yields and self safeguard the environment? Um, food security, clearly, but environmental sustainability. These are, if you like, the, the key points of sustainable intensification and the fact that we're going to need multiple approaches. When we unpack that, the key things we have to think about are can we maintain biodiversity and do we do that through this idea of land sharing or land sparing? What about animal welfare? This is a, a key co consideration. Reducing waste. Thinking about that's production, processing, consumption waste. What about the nutrition angle and looking at sustainable intensification from the point of view of consumption? What's it doing for rural economies? We heard from Thomas about the impacts of, of changing agriculture uh, in, in Africa there. And then this broader aspect of, of sustainable development, because aquaculture does, the effects do spread worldwide. Well, first of all, intensification, diversification. What we see is, I, I'm not sure where the pointer is. Is it, is it? Oh, have you got it there? Thank you. Um, basically, the big growth here is not in the big blue, it's not in the sea um, at all, um, which is the black, it's grown. But we can. one of the things that marks aquaculture out, a lot of it's non-extractive, you don't need to feed it. Uh, seaweeds are microalgae, non-fed inland. Um, fish that filter feed, feed low in the food chain. We don't necessarily have to feed them uh, formulated diets. But they are not really growing that fast compared to the big areas, this one, which is fed and it's inland. That's uh, 
if you like, the thing that we really, I think, need to think about. Are there other choices? And uh, this is a, a small piece of data, but I think worth thinking about. Uh, when we take a mixture of carps and tilapias, fish that grow well in freshwater systems, they feed on natural foods. When we just keep them, whether they're low input or control systems, so normally in Bangladesh, under two tons a hectare is the normal yield. Just by accessing and using more locally available nutrients, we can more than double yields. So that yield gap is quite impressive, and it's not done through large amounts of new technology, new genes, no. This is something that farmers have been shown can do with their current resources. The concept of land sharing and sparing. Again, aquaculture can do that. Um, here in, uh, in, in Bangladesh, it could be Vietnam, people actually using the same piece of land and water for producing more than one crop, rice, and fish and prawns and a whole bunch of indigenous fish in that system. So that natural biodiversity actually being spared, if you like. Or should we be moving to you know, more um, intensive closed monocultures in the hope that we can then spare land that can be held, held aside, a bit like the larger farmers who are not cultivating their land so intensively because they're, they're really intensifying on a smaller area. So that's one of the questions I think we have to ask. What type of aquaculture do we really want? Welfare, well, there's lots of things going on with welfare around the world, mainly in Europe, because European consumers are most sensitive to it. Understandably, uh, people think of their own welfare and their children's welfare before the animal, I think, in many developing countries. But I think one of the questions is, how can we get a bag of shrimp for you know, 10 euros, a big bag of shrimp, um, so cheaply? And a lot of it comes down to the technology that's been used to produce it, and that's involved in the past, something called eye stalk ablation, where you cut the eye off a shrimp to get it to breed when you want it to. Uh, not very nice. It was done because the shrimp was a wild shrimp, and in order to control that reproductive cycle, that's what you needed to do. Not very nice, but I'm pleased to say you don't need to use it. With modern strains that are domesticated, they're improved. Actually, a piece of research that's been funded by various bits of the industry, including seafood buyers in Europe, American international organizations, and the companies themselves, is coming out with actually quite simple and straightforward solutions to getting higher productivity and the results you need. What about reducing waste? You've seen some of the waste coming out of the cages I, I mentioned was a big problem. Uh, but most aquaculture globally is done in ponds, simple earthen ponds. And here we see, I think, again, quite a lot of uh, innovation going towards reuse of nutrients locally. How can we support and promote that further? I think we also have to look at using the whole animal. You know, for a, a one kilo salmon, only 60% is the fillet you eat. What happens to the heads? What happens to the frames? And there's increasing amount of work actually looking at what you do, how you add value to those products. We also have to rethink plate waste, and this is particularly important in countries that eat too much. And a, a piece of work here says, you know, let's look at sustainability. Let's just reduce portion size. That's not going to work in countries where we want people to eat more fish for their nutrition. Rural or urban economy, how is it being changed by aquaculture? Uh, again, back in, in uh, Bangladesh, we looked at, at rural and peri-urban <laughs> fish production, and what you see is that urban markets really stimulate sales for the market. These are not large ponds. They're usually ponds that are commercial. They're often integrated with producing not just fish, but growing vegetables around the side as well, or more commercially. And these together are a food system that's really making an impact particularly in, in peri-urban areas through finance, but in rural areas, people are eating more as well. You can't really start to think about some of the consumption-led changes with aquaculture unless you consider China. And particularly rural China, inland China, we hear a lot about the growth in the coastal provinces, but if you go to Hubei, which is an inland carp-eating province where there's lots of water, what's happening there? Are people eating the same old, same old? Are things growing fast? We're again looking at urban and rural areas, and these are a bunch of species that are widely grown. People don't grow monocultures in inland systems there. They're a mixture, a polyculture of different animals. 
And uh, what we see is that these would be the traditional polyculture of carps that feed low in the food chain and are relatively resource light. And these ones tend to be a lot more resource intensive, requiring feeding from outside. And we see the growth rates there actually uh, the frequency of consumption, the desire for consumption is growing much faster, particularly in urban areas. So we can see that through these orange spots, orange uh, bars. And if you look at the trends there, if you, if you see what people are wanting to eat more of and indeed are eating more of, what we see is, again, these more resource-intensive animals. They're aspirational in terms of inland China. And that holds some issues in terms of going forward, how we're, the planet uh, is really going to cope with the resources required. We're also moving to a context where people traditionally, of course, like to buy live seafood in China towards more urbanization and a move, particularly if you're a higher income uh, consumer, towards accepting to buy your fish in a frozen form, often in a value-added form. Um, again, what are the implications for, for changes, these dietary changes that are fitted to broader development changes, what's happening? So in terms of that rural economy, I was very interested in Thomas's point about rural economy, but really affected by urban. What's really happening? Can we see aquaculture as being part of a rural livelihood? Does it have to be about export? Well, no. For every freshwater prawn produced in this pond, there will probably be three, two or three freshwater fish that are eaten locally. What about working in the value chain? And what about the quality of that work? Uh, again, uh, media, uh, uh, issue, media interest in, in bonded and slavery in seafood value chains. How are we trying to get rid of that? How are we making sure that the quality of work is good? And it's something that young people want to stay in rural areas to do. Seafood value chains are very value, valuable. If we put fisheries and aquaculture together, it's a trillion, a trillion dollars. Um, again, what about the value of that to the individual? They're complex. Uh, they're, they're, it's a very valuable internationally traded product. And when we look at that, um, how are we going to ensure that there is the governance in place, not just for international markets, but to meet local market needs as well. If you're uh, a Muslim, for example, how can you make sure the ingredients fed your fish are, are acceptable? Um, and these value chains get longer and longer. We've heard about fish and shrimp coming from Asia to Europe. Well, there's a big trade in salmon going the other way. And again, elite uh, consumption patterns, they are uh, making a difference. Um, then again, back to local consumption in Egypt, Almost all of that tilapia is being consumed by local, uh, by local and medium to poor consumers in that area and providing a lot of uh, livelihood opportunities for, for those people involved. Not just in farming, which tend to be a much smaller number, but in the whole value chain. I think moving on to where the, the information needs are, we have to think about planning for this complexity and, and the fact that aquaculture is fulfilling different roles in different parts of the world. What we definitely need are systems thinkers, and we need to think that with the few people specially trained in aquaculture, how we can share knowledge between sectors. Um, so if we take nutrition and feed on one hand, or reproduction and genetics on another, or health and welfare, there's lots of opportunities for crossover um, in, in terms of knowledge sets between terrestrial and aquatic livestock. And if you take, for example, the recent merger of EWOS and Cargill, that sort of shows it. That's where the big commercial concerns are going. They realize there's synergy there. And I think we need to look at that more broad-based. Often, the same feedstocks are being used for chicken and pigs as for aquaculture products. How can we promote a global, essentially, community of practice? where commercially orientated aquaculture, because that's where the growth is, can really be integrated with civil society and get that research for development environment right, ensure there's a social license to operate, and make sure that we've got people-centered benefits. And I think they have to be based on maintaining the planetary dimensions, uh, uh, climate change, etc., but making sure people's nutrition is good. I'm going to come on to that very shortly. Um, we need governance and rules. This has largely taken the form 
in terms of international organizations are thinking about where aquaculture should be, um, what type it is, but we need to think more about who's it for. And we need knowledge through that value chain. We need knowledge, wherever it's from the input side, whoops, the input side, right through to consumers. And how are we going to do that cost effectively uh, and within the resource needs of, of, of the organizations and, and actors and stakeholders who do that? So a few examples. Um, there's a, an example here of an of a information sharing platform that was funded by the EU called Sarnissa that's sought out to spread and engage people who are involved in, in, in aquaculture and have an interest in aquaculture. Now, that's not just university-based researchers by any means. Uh, we're trying to link together bright sparks. Where is good practice? Where are the knowledge deficits? And try and link them together through uh, a, a Facebook that has over 4,000 uh, followers. And this is the sort of thing that goes on in terms of how people interact people being made aware of new opportunities, new feed technologies, um, people moving information between each other quite informally without any great costs involved. This, of course, needs Africa to be cabled within the internet, which, of course, is happening faster than, than we can think. Um, a specific case, one of the larger farms in West Africa, 7,000 tons, um, tropical farms, uh, using Sarnissa to actually identify places to, to buy cage materials, where to get new staff, where to get information. And this is uh, a, a very dynamic and uh, um, exciting way, I think, to start spreading information and, and best practice. Such uh, private enterprises are really becoming hubs of how aquaculture is spreading around Africa. Another idea is that of using essentially multi-stakeholder uh, platforms of various types. Here's one we're involved with in the European Union called EURASTIP. And the basic idea is that you engage, you engage knowledge brokerage between uh, commercial actors who are, are really the growth, uh, the, the growth vehicles in aquaculture and all the other stakeholders, whether they're regulators, whether they're academics or whatever. And this is being done in three countries in Asia. And with as much effort to engage across those countries as between those countries and Europe, which I think is really important. And indeed, there's already a lot of commercial linkages and networks that link these three countries in Asia, and indeed these, are these countries with, with Africa. What else is going on? Challenge prizes. How can we in energize and innovative types of approaches to spreading aquaculture. This is a, a piece of work that's been, uh, being initiated by the Challenge Prize Center from the Global Innovation Fund. And the way they do it is they look for the, the knowledge gaps, the problems, and look about how we should be engaging innovation to overcome those problems. And this is one that's identified the lack of integrated services for small and medium producers in India and Bangladesh where this prize is going to be offered. And that's been done through a series of stakeholder interactions. And the idea is the winners will get a prize to allow them to carry out their initiative. And another one was on nutrition. So this one's very much on production, and this one's on consumption. Once we've got our aquaculture products, how can we focus some of them on the most vulnerable groups in those countries, which tend to be uh, pregnant women, adolescent women, and young children? Another one, an innovation challenge in Vietnam happened two weeks ago. Lots and lots of people interested, six finalists, and then brought together to pitch their idea to try and gain traction in the market. So investors see what the idea is and pay up and go in. And uh, the winner gets a prize. In this case, it was a Vietnamese group trying to promote insect-based feeds in Vietnam. And so they got a prize of $10,000, but the main thing is they've attracted a lot of attention to their idea. They've had support to develop it further. And hopefully that, again, leads to greater innovation. I'd like to finish on just one or two thoughts about interdisciplinary thinking more on the international level, because I think we need to, uh, perhaps uh, as people involved in fisheries and aquaculture, think of the outputs as just being part of food systems, which I don't think we've done enough of in the past. I think there's a realization um, in the recent State of Fisheries and Aquaculture FAO report that 
you know, fish is about food, it's about nutrition. But are we, in, are we engaging enough? Are we engaging, for example, in the sustain, sustainable development goal setting, which uh, is set the mandate really for rural development, uh, for diva, sorry, for development uh, in the overview? And of course, 14 is the one, life below water, which is one of particular interest if you're into promoting aquaculture. And how does that link into current nutritional thinking, as has been guided by the, the SDGs? I'm afraid it's not actually being considered in the way that I think it should have. Um, malnutrition in all its forms, uh, yes, there's uh, undernutrition, particularly in vulnerable groups. There's a lot of overnutrition as well, obesity, etc. Where does aquaculture fit into changing that? And I think, worryingly, life under the water there were found to be no indicators relevant to nutrition. I think that's a fundamental problem. Unless the international community can start looking as the products from water, as food, and an integral part of quality diets, I think we have a real problem. I think we have to support innovation amongst those for whom it's most important, the producers, others in the value chain, through let's push out better management practices, how much of that should be linked to certification and standard setting? This is a, an emotional issue in many parts of the world. How much should consumer-facing organizations tell producers what they should be producing? Um, lots of new interesting ideas, which I think are innovative, around, well, let's not look at individual farms. Let's look at groups or zones of production um, and try and get improvement in their environmental and social performance there. How are we getting messages and information out at the grassroots? Conventional extension services, state-supported, really don't work. But what we see all over the world connected with aquaculture are consultant practitioners, lead farmers, who are, who are knowledgeable and share that information. The role of processing and feed nodes, processing plants, feed production plants. These are places, whether you're in rural Africa or in rural Asia, are nodes of expertise that could support sustainable intensification. I think mixed outcomes, but this idea of market-led governance is unlikely to disappear, and I think in the countries of production, they need to make it work for them. But thinking of uh, the farmers in the future, I'd like to ask if you have any questions, and thank you very much.